look at various policy. I mean, when you have you know 375 pieces of policy, there are sorry of, of legislation. There's a lot of work to do there. But you also the the flip side is you have to build relationships. It's imperative, and especially when you have a party that's as new as ours. And we need to rebrand and refresh and earn people's respect back, earn that space. People always talk about, well, we have to be unified or there's going to be a code of conduct of how we behave in the legislature. Well, the leader has to lead by example. Your cabinet has to lead by example. The people in the legislature have to lead by example. And you be, you build unity. You cannot demand it. You build friendships. You build relationships. You look at the various personalities of people and see what their talents and their strengths are and you build on those things. That's Leela here. By, by the way, Leela, if you're wondering, we just got bumped off YouTube for some reason, but the podcast has been rolling the whole time. So I, I know you and I both are kind of going, what on earth is I lost the sight of your face for a quick second, but we're all good. The podcast is recording uninterrupted. And, and, and so the good news is that uh, obviously this message is going to make it way out. You're, it's way out. You're going to get people talking today. Uh, this announcement obviously is going to is going to infuse some new interest. Uh, into this leadership race. We don't exactly know to this point uh, what that final list of uh, contenders is going to look like, but I uh, expect you to run a strong campaign, obviously, and I know you're going to be facing some direct questions from people that want to know what your plan is on certain files. Let me close with asking you this one. The curriculum, is uh, this uh, redo, this rewrite, has been a obviously a contentious one. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the overwhelming majority of school boards have said we don't even want to pilot this thing. We don't want to introduce this thing. It's It's very problematic. Um, in closing, uh, what would be your plan with this uh, curriculum overhaul? How would you approach it? We're, we've already actually put out um, the questions to our writing, and I'm meeting with people right across the province. It, it's one thing to sort of hear things uh, through the, the channels that we get, but I'm actually meeting with our trustees and our boards this week. Um, my entire premise around this is to find out what they need. I'm not here to push anything, Ryan. Um, I'm a facilitator. My job is to work on behalf of the people of Alberta and not push my own agenda. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation and willing to do whatever it takes to make this right and to be able to help our, our school boards and our teachers and our parents and our families have the best education system in the world. But I, we have a lot of work to do to rebuild trust. And part of that is going to be having those conversations to find out what it is that I can do to help. And, and I wish everybody else the best of luck in all of this. And I just, I'm so grateful that you would take the time to have me on. I'm just so humbled and so honored by all of this and so ready and willing to work with people and understand what their needs are because my job is to work for you. It always has been. I, I just, I'm just I'm a little, I'm overwhelmed, but joyful at the same time. And very, very excited about the difficult questions because they deserve to be answered and asked. And um, hopefully I will be able to provide a very serious and uh, compelling alternative to what's being offered. Well, I always appreciate your availability here, Leela. And, and uh, you know, to be clear, the door, the door is always open here to, to conversations uh, with people that give a rip, you know, with with people that are um, interested in policy, that are affected by policy in particular, that have the the power, the ability, the privilege to pull those levers, right, to drive a lot of that process. And of course, you know, in front of an engaged audience as well. So uh, to me, regardless of political stripe, uh, we're here for those conversations. What's real talk without that kind of a commitment? And so we appreciate your availability. Thanks for making the announcement here on our show. And we wish you best of luck through this leadership campaign. Thank you so much, Ryan, and all the best to you and your beautiful family and looking forward to many more conversations. Thanks very much, Leela. That's uh, Leela here. She's uh, obviously uh, the MLA uh, for the constituency of Chestermere, Rocky View, uh, down in southern Alberta, a beautiful part of the province. Uh, she's been a Wild Rose MLA before that, so she's, she's obviously seen the, you know, the perspective from government. She sat around the cabinet table in past. Uh, and, of course, she's served on the official opposition, so she's got some political experience there. Uh, first elected in 2015 in the Alberta election there. Uh, we're going to be going live to France in just a second. How cool is that? want to check in with a good friend of this show, Kristen Rayworth. She's there with her dad. Looks to me, I've been following along on her Instagram and her Twitter in like a trip of a lifetime. Uh, that included some time observing the anniversary of the Normandy landings, D-Day. She was there at Juno Beach uh, just a couple of days ago, and she's going to talk to us about that experience in just a moment. 
Speaking of getting out of town, uh, speaking of taking off, and of course, we're talking about cost of living. That infuses itself into every conversation we have, doesn't it? You want to keep some money in your jeans, even if you're heading out internationally for a week, two weeks, maybe even longer than that. We recommend you park your car at Jet Set Parking. If you're flying out of the city of Edmonton, if you're flying out of EIA, Edmonton International Airport, you can save money by booking online today at jetsetparking.com. Make sure you give yourself at least 24 hours advance notice, right? If you're flying out tomorrow, you got to do it right now. If you're flying out next week, even if you're flying out in December of 2022, you can book today using the promo code REALTALK. Why does that matter? Because the promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com gets you airport parking for $7 a day, less than 50 bucks a week. What? You park your car there. You take the shuttle to the departures area. I mean, it's so smooth and easy. When you touch back down, the shuttle takes you back to your car. You use your credit card to swipe you out of the lot. You don't have to worry about losing one of these little ticket stubs. I'm always paranoid about that when I travel. It's never been easier to save money by booking online using the promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com. I told you about my neighbor Chad yesterday. I'm just like staring out my front window now. Just, I mean, just just oogling his new Dodge Ram crew cab. This guy's got just a beautiful whip. He's got that new truck strut. You know what I'm talking about, Johnny? I saw him out the other day. I mean, he's had, he's had this thing for like three days. He's, uh, he's already, he's just making sure it stays looking meticulous. Who can blame the guy? What a beautiful machine. He reached out to me. I told you he's got his new family trailer. He said, I need something I can pull. I don't have to worry about. Nothing more important than his family's safety. So he trusts Dodge Ram, and he picked it up at St. Albert Dodge. Brad and his team at St. Albert Dodge hooking up my pal Chad. Sherwood Dodge as well is where you'll find Alberta's best selection of Ram, of Jeep, and of the entire Dodge lineup. Whether you're ramping things up, something to pull your trailer, or maybe... With the price of fuel the way it is, maybe you're looking for something four cylinders. They've got the best selection in the province. You can find them online. Shop the Sponsors tab under our website, ryanjesperson.com. Well, Kristen Rayworth has been on the show before as a sexual violence survivor, as an advocate for, for, for other people. She cares very deeply about other people. She works uh, in municipal politics right now as a political advisor and strategist, but that's not really why she's here with us today. She's here with us today because she is right in the middle of a trip of a lifetime with her dad. She checks in now live from France. Thank you for making time for us. This is, this is like the wine and cheese hour, isn't it? Yeah, it's five o'clock here, so absolutely it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, we promise we won't keep you for too long, and I want to thank you for joining us. Where are you specifically right now, Kristen? Um, so we're in Bondol, which is just in the southern part of France, uh, right on the tip, uh, so at the Mediterranean Ocean. And you are with your dad. Uh, yeah. And this appears He's... to be, I mean, by the smile on your face, the trip of a lifetime. Yeah, it's been really great. Um, so my stepmother passed away in December, so my dad really wanted to, to do this and, and come to France because she was French. Um, she was born here and raised here. So we came to see her family and to see a bunch of friends who couldn't come to the funeral. And so this is a really special trip for us to be able to be close to um, our family and get to see people. And for my dad to get to have that opportunity to see a bunch of friends who he hasn't seen and family who he hasn't seen in a long time. Cause my stepmom was sick for a very long time. So they couldn't travel. So, I mean, literally uh, virtually everywhere you go, the soil that you tread upon the hands that you shake, the people that you hug, there's meaning to almost every yeah. single thing that you're experiencing over there right now. Yeah. And like my parents lived here, my dad and my stepmom lived here for uh, 10 years plus so this is where they were the last time, right before she got sick, right before they came back to Canada. So it's it's really meaningful for my dad to be able to be here. And it's meaningful for me because we're meeting people who um, loved her very much and knew her very well. And so that's been very special. Hmm. How much was, like when we talk about D-Day, I mean, of course, the average Canadian is going to have a, a working knowledge, a bit of a general understanding of D-Day and the significance of those Normandy landings. We're talking to author and historian Don Levers yesterday, 156,000 troops, Canadian, mm -hmm. British, and American troops landing on five different beaches, June 6th, 1944, observing the 78th anniversary of it yesterday. Obviously, a turning point, a major turning point when it came to World War II 
and have everything all played out was 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 observing the anniversary of D-Day something kind of circled on your calendar with regards to this trip had you had you targeted Juno Beach specifically right around June 4th 5th 6th to, yeah. to make sure you had that experience so my uh, my stepmom grew up in uh, Blois, which is in sort of the northern northern part of France, which is right around the Normandy beaches. So when we were planning the trip, that was something that was really important to me to get to go uh, to Juno Beach close to D-Day. I'd never been. I've been to France multiple times, but I've never had the opportunity to go there. And it was it was incredibly humbling to get to be there and, and walking on those beaches and being the, being present there and realizing what that actually meant for so many people. And in France, it's incredibly meaningful. Like France still, re- like they still have so many monuments at remembering D-Day because they were occupied and it was incredibly difficult in France for a long time. And so they celebrate it every single year. There are parties, there are things across, and they, they always thank Canadians. They're very, very um, aware that it was Canada and, and the UK who, who helped, as well as the Americans. We talk a lot about the Americans' involvement in D-Day, but Canada had an incredibly big involvement. And I think that kind of gets kind of lost when we talk about like the Hollywood version of D-Day, which is so focused on the U.S., component but yeah. Canada and the UK were very present yeah in a major way and it's I I uh I, I think and, and I'm grateful that you talk about the Hollywood version of it because that that is it we've all seen the movies I also think that that's a hugely important element of it from to, to, to sort of feel that visceral terror mm-hmm. like I remember speaking to a to a, a, a d-day soldier uh in a radio interview a few years ago the guy's in his 90s and he's talking about these landing these watercraft that were essentially made out of plywood and he's talking about yeah. bullets just whizzing past and, 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 and then sort of these doors would open and there's the beach and go ahead and you know try to make it to the sand try to make and I just can't even wrap my mind around that kind of a thing um, when it came to the the memories of the recollection of the French people you're talking to, I think it is uh, certainly noteworthy when you mentioned the fact that it was occupied. Um, you're seeing monuments everywhere. You're you're seeing sort of oh, yeah. permanent memories of these types of things. This is almost like a daily reality type scenario. So when I came to Canada, to France the first time, which was in 1998, um, my grandfather, who was a um, he was a member of the French resistance and he was actually jailed by the Nazis at one point. Um, he took us around Boulogne, which is where my stepmom was born and showed us all the different places where you can see still uh, the effects of the bombings and the effects of the war. And you go anywhere in France and you can see still uh, where they were bombed, where there were places that that had to be rebuilt completely from scratch. My aunt lives in a place called Calais, which is in the northern part of France, that was having to be be completely rebuilt almost because of the occupation. So you see it everywhere and people in France feel it and know it very much because it is part of their everyday reality. And we're not talking about like you know, their great, 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 great pam- grandparents, it's their parents who had to go through this, who had to go through the occupation. And so you very much you see it everywhere that you go, especially in the northern part of France. In the south, which is where I am now, it's a little bit less, but in the northern part, especially the closer you get to the beaches, you see it everywhere. You see monuments to it everywhere. You see the effects of it everywhere because so many of these cities had to rebuild from scratch after uh, Germany lost the war. Hmm. Did anything, did, did you learn anything or did you have an epiphany or did you have kind of a significant moment as, as you literally walked the sand of Juno beach reflecting on DD? Was there one thing that'll stick with you for the rest of your life? I think just, just realizing that when I was 18 years old, I was going to the iron horse and probably drinking too much and, you know, <laughs> Like I, I did nothing of, of, you know, deep measure at the age of 18. I worked Earl's and like these, these kids, they were 18 years old, 19 years old, and they were liberating a country. It's, it's incredibly amazing to understand how young they were. And you walk by and they have a section um, in Juno Beach where they, they actually put up the names of every Canadian who died 
at Juno Beach. Yeah, that picture right there. Wow. And they're all, they're 17, 18, 19 years old. They're kids, they're babies. And it, it's incredible to me to think about the bravery that that takes to do that. And I think that is the thing that's most humbling about it is realizing how, how young they were. And I guess as I get older, 17 seems so young to me now, right? And so it, it's Cause it crazy. Because it is. They're, they're, Cause it is, Babies. I know, right? Like it's, you know, we have a guy, little guy about to turn seven, like that's, that's in 10 years. You know, I just can't even, I can't even imagine it. I was walking my dog the other day and just sort of somewhat, I guess, accidentally, I just had time on my hands and, and we meandered into a, c- a cemetery by our house. And, you know, I've got a great uncle in there and went and visited him and said hello. But I, I, I you know, I walked past Kristen, these rows and rows and rows yeah. of, of the military type headstones, um, honoring in, in a big uh, cenotaph, I guess you'd call it, honoring uh, Canada's war dead from World War One in particular, uh, but also World War Two and throughout. You could see some some of the 1960s, presumably from Korea. And anyway, the point is looking at the ages of these people. Yeah. Like you're saying, it was blowing my mind. One in particular, this young man's name, 24 years of age. And it said missing and presumed dead. And I thought even just of how many there were of those, you know, perhaps shot down over water. Who knows? Perhaps a prisoner of war. Who knows? Um, But the sacrifice that these families made, that these young men and women made, I mean, it's just really I hope. Um, and even by, you know, you doing this interview here right in the middle of, of, of happy hour on your vacation, just to remind <laughs> us, I mean, but, but seriously, people of, of yeah. our vintage, you know, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even younger people um, to take a moment that, yeah, it was 78 years ago. But this, th- these were thousands and thousands of young people, their whole lives ahead of them. Um, and yet this was their act of service. And, and I hope it's something that people continue to reflect on, even though the, the footage is grainy and black and white and hard to relate to. We can't really wrap our minds around it, uh, but it's such an important exercise. There's So there are Canadian um, uh, cemeteries across the northern part of France. So there's one in Boulogne that my uncle took me to uh, before I went to Juno Beach. And there was a gravestone there that really struck me. And it said um, he was a friend to everyone and he died so that others could know freedom. And I think that's just, that's incredibly meaningful to understand that France is a free country because of the Canadian soldiers and the UK soldiers and the US soldiers who came here. And this country is so indebted to them and they they talk about it like every time i tell someone i'm a canadian or i don't actually have to tell someone they hear it in my french accent (laughs) but every time i I talk to people that's what they talk about and they talk about um what what canada did during the second world war there is still so much gratitude from uh from the french people to the canadian people for that and it's incredibly meaningful and it's very humbling to, to be at Juno Beach, to hear that from people and to realize like just the the gratitude and the gravity of what Canada did and what we did for the people here. So that's beautiful. Absolutely amazing stuff. Hey, listen, I, I know your dad's probably looking for uh, his sidekick here. He's, he's, he's waiting for his <laughs> dinner date. And uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your evening on such a special day and such a special vacation uh, to give us this perspective check. Kristen, thanks so much and have an amazing rest of your trip through France. And congratulations on your baby. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Looking forward to having you meet him in person. I know. I can't wait. That's Kristen Rayworth. You can uh, follow her. I, I suggest you follow her on Twitter. Of course, we, uh, from our official account at Real Talk RJ, include and, and, and announce essentially every morning right around 8 o'clock Mountain, 10 o'clock Eastern, the guests that are going to be on the show. Um, the point of that is to let you know, of course, who's coming up, but also so you can connect with them. And Kristen's been posting photos and through her trip and like a lot of really fun stuff, too. I think they're 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 endeavoring to drink all the wine in France. I would do the exact same thing if I was there. What a special trip. Her and her dad and the meaning behind behind that and the family history there really really cool stuff and we appreciate Kristen being able to make some time for us today it's wild to wrap your mind around isn't it she's talking about these 17 and 18 year olds that were off to war I mean to put it into perspective a lot of them cannot even they're like lying about their age to to go yeah they wanted to wanted to go kill Hitler that's what they wanted to go do incredible
I don't know, like, I don't know if this is a fruitful or fruitless exercise. Maybe it's a stupid conversation to host, but people always say, like, what about today's generation? Like, but I don't know, man. I look at even, do we have that? Or maybe you say, well, you don't know until you're in it. You don't know until you're in that scenario, that circumstance. I don't know. I think of 9-11, some friends of mine in the States in particular, one of my close friends, uh, Paul down in Seattle, like he was a, an iron worker. You know, he was, he was one of those building, I think it's called Quest Field, right? The NFL, the Seahawks field. Mm-hmm. Anyway, doesn't matter. He's a journeyman. 9-11 happens, went and signed up. Uh, signed up all, first for the reserves, ended up for this. They're called the CBs. They go in, they're like a combat construction unit. And they would go in and build like combat bridges and do like really, really kind of hairy, kind of sketchy stuff. Anyway, he was prompted. He did two tours in Iraq uh, because and, and he was motivated because of 9-11. That's his personal story. Now, someone will say, well, Iraq's not the same as World War II. And sure, fair enough. I'm yeah, just saying, and all like, that, do we but... still have that? Do we have that in us? Would 18 year olds today or, or us, you know, me? 25 years ago when I was 18, like, would I have had it in me or would I have been the, you know, and there's people too, I was going to say, would I have been like a draft dodger? That was a, if you look back on it, history has been kind to the Vietnam (laughs) draft dodgers, right? So there's that too. But I mean, you know, how would you handle it? If you got drafted, if you were off, you know, with, with what, six weeks of training and and all of a sudden you're off to Europe, right? I think to most of us, that's why we respect our veterans so much. It's almost a nightmare to think about it now today. If if you just got a letter or someone came to your house and said, Hey, tomorrow you're shipping out, you're going over there. You're going to be, you know, involved in this incredible nightmare and you don't know when you're coming home. So that's why I think that's why we respect them so much. Like you said, like the ones who didn't get conscripted, they signed up. They wanted to do it. And yeah. nowadays, I don't know if a lot of us would have that courage to go do it. You know? Yeah. Like, I have no problem saying I, I would be terrified. Same. I'm sure a lot of them I'd be were. looking for every possible, you know, everyone's always like, you know, Donald Trump, like, and actually Draft I'm not Dodger, sitting here right? to jump yeah. like to Donald Trump's defense, but people are, you know, he said he had like a foot or like a bone spur in his heel or something. He couldn't serve. And I'm like, I kind of wonder it. if I might find a reason <laughs> right. to try to not go. Yeah. And then you think of all these veterans now these days, you typically, you know, there's, there are a, a few that remain. We're so lucky to have that perspective every November 11th or anytime mm-hmm. you pop into a legion, you have a chance to pick the brain of these people and. I always look into their eyes or like look at their hands and it's like these are people that that were willing to give their lives. And there was a lot of question marks like back then you're in a ditch, you know, for days in the rain Mm -hmm. with muddy socks. Nowadays, you could at least have a bit of security in the fact that you're in top of the line equipment and FaceTime with your family. Yeah, it was a whole it was 10 times, 100 times worse back then. Yeah. Yeah. Marie right now says my dad signed up at 16 in World War Two. Yeah. Right. Insane. You know, Tanya says some people have it like that courage. You know, others have become too comfortable thinking that these are other people's problems. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to put it. Wow. Unwarranted design on our live chat says my granddad was a tail gunner in a Lancaster bomber. Those guys had a combat life expectancy measured in minutes. Right. And Hodge says if people feel the situation is desperate enough They'll do what needs to be done. And Haas, I, th- I think you're right about that. I do believe that there is a certain element to that. Well, we'll keep this conversation going. I always want to pick your brains. Where are you at? Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can send us an email. Every Tuesday, thanks to our friends at Leading Edge Physiotherapy, we have an opportunity to recognize a person or an innovation or a group in this context that's making a difference, that's innovating, that's impacting the world around them. We call it the Leading Edge. And on the leading edge this week, we are very proud to shine the spotlight on Out Loud St. Albert. Their leading edge's charity of the month for this month. It's Pride Month, of course. So what sets Out Loud St. Albert apart? It's a safe, inclusive space for youth who feel different to connect with each other and allies away from the intense bullying, the high suicide rates that are still tragically prevalent when it comes to LGBTQ2S plus youth. Uh, Mia Sotart and her father Terry created the Out Loud Foundation almost 10 years ago for community LGBTQ2S plus supports and services. Mia fortunately came out to a supportive family, but but they soon realized there wasn't an understanding. There wasn't non-judgmental environment for other diverse youth struggling with their sexuality, their gender identities, in particular in St. Albert. And so... They started twice monthly adult supervised youth meetings, and it's grown to support all ages, including juniors meetings like 12 and under youth 
18 plus, and then P Flag, which is parents, families, and friends of lesbians and gays meetings, an integrated team offering a ton of different professional resources. They've expanded to speaking programs in schools and businesses, and they further partnered with the city of St. Albert to host recurring pride celebrations, and fundraising events. They've created a formal partners program for local businesses and community groups to partner with and sponsor out loud. It's amazing how they're approaching this with advocacy and support, inclusion in GSAs and QSAs in schools. And of course, sitting on various committees, working groups across the community to ensure that queer voices are heard when it comes to the public service. Now, they've got some upcoming events we want to let you know about, including the Morinville Pride Picnic, the Sturgeon County Pride at Cardiff Park on June 14th, June 18th, St. Albert Pride at Rotary Park, and June 25th, Edmonton Pride Fest at Churchill Square. You can learn all about it at outloudstalbert.ca. Out Loud St. Albert is on today's Leading Edge. Leading Edge is presented by Leading Edge Physiotherapy. Life shouldn't hurt. Well... The dream is done for Edmonton Oilers fans across the country. A hell of a run all the way to the Western Conference final. But that's where the team ran into a bit of a wall. The Colorado mm. Avalanche, of course, dispatching your Oilers in four straight. We're going to get to the head host, Andrew Walker, in just a second. Wanted to tee this up. A comment last night from one of the Oilers superstars, uh, the Deutschland dangler, Leon Dreisaitl. Here's what he had to say in retrospect. To, to get to this point, of course, um, I don't think anyone necessarily expected us to be here. With that being said, we expected to be here, and, and we want to be here, and we want to be even further, right? So... Um, I'm proud of the group, but, um, you know, obviously it's, it's very disappointing and, and, and it sucks right now. Um, but we have to make sure that we come back next season and understand how hard it is to win, um, what it takes to go on a deep run and, and take that next step. That next step, of course, which would be a berth in the Stanley Cup final and, and ultimately the first cup. Uh, for that organization since 1990. But it won't happen this year. Andrew Walker's been covering this run uh, with The Hedge Podcast at thehedgepod.com, joining us live in studio this morning for straight. It's always tough to get swept, uh, but it seemed to become apparent early in this series that the Colorado Avalanche, I hate to say it out loud, but just just a better team. Yeah, I mean, I, I think number one, it's a tough way to go out because you or sh- should have won last night and at least should have won, you know, one of these these two home games. Uh, but I-, I think it's a wildly successful season. I-, I, th- I think it's really easy. This is why social media is tough and Twitter is tough. I had to turn it off this morning because you're trying to read and people are like, I knew it. I told you so. It's like, dude, it's the conference finals. Yeah, like, there's there's 28 teams that are golfing right now. And, you know, the Oilers made it to the final four. Um, and you saw a team that uh, in Colorado that clearly is is just a little better in 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 a few areas. And if you, you know you're watching the game last night, and Darnell Nurse is obviously incredibly hurt, and 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 you know comes out after he had a torn hip flexor. I don't know how you can skate. I can I can barely skate after having a couple of beers the night before, let alone a torn, torn hip flexor. And Dreitzel, I mean, that was crazy to watch last night. Four points, and he could barely move. Um, so it, it all adds up to, I think it was a really successful season if you're Edmonton, and they lost to a team that's going to be lifting the Stanley Cup in a couple of weeks, I would guess. Yeah, you think? Yeah. Uh, what do you, who do you think is coming out of the East? Do you think it's going to be Tampa, New York? Where do you see this going? I, I, I kind of still think it's Tampa. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to see. I mean, it, it, listen, you get either the Colorado Avalanche lifting um, the franchise's third cup, but the first with this leadership group with like Landis Gog, McCarr, mm-hmm. McKinnon. I mean, just really an incredible cast. It's their it's their first cup appearance in 21 years, and and that kind of just oddly surprises me. Yeah, yeah. You, you think, but you think back to the I mean the heyday of of those high powered teams. We're just back old in, as shit. Just That's weird. What it is, <laughs> we're yeah. just super. It'd be fucking like old. it'd be like someone being like the Islanders. I thought they were really good. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, not no. Were, yeah. yeah, but and, and then you've got on the flip side, you know, either either the New York Rangers with this superstar goaltender i love the battle of the russian goalies in the eastern conference final or you have tampa looking for three straight which we haven't seen since uh well we haven't seen it in person 
at all. I mean, obviously, the New York Islanders is the last to do it yep. in the early 1980s, so it'd be something special. So it's kind of a cool storyline um, right now. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, both of them averaging you know two points a game or better through this run. Really unbelievable. And, and McDavid, I mean, his performance speaks for itself. In 16 games, 33 points. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl in 16 games, 32 points. Bananas, these two. And when it comes to the work that uh, the front office has to do, the general manager, Kenny Holland, and his team through the offseason, um, you know, some people will look at goaltending. Some people are going to probably look at, you know, what this defense core looks like. Maybe Chris Russell's played his last game as, a, as an Oiler. Uh, Duncan Keith's getting up there with one more year on his deal. But what does the offseason look like for this team? Well, it's going to be tricky, that's for sure. And uh, I, I think that's another level of annoyance. Um, you know, people forecasting a lot of doom and gloom. Because well, look at the cap space. Look at the guys they got to resign. And I mean that that's just that's just hockey. That's just business. That's just the NHL. You're going to have decisions to make. Some guys need new contracts. The important part is who are your key pieces? Um, a healthy nurse, McDavid, Dreisaitl, um, Yamamoto, Zach, Hyman. Zach I mean, Hyman. They're all under contract, right? They're going to have to you know see where Pulyarvi fits in. You're going to have to look at at the goaltending. Koskinen's obviously gone. Um, and I think uh, another narrative is really easy to be like, well, you know, Mike Smith, how can they? Mike Smith was making $2 million and, and went to the conference finals. Like, yeah. you know, so I, I don't think it's time to dunk on Mike Smith. Uh, you know, obviously he's 40. He's not the long term answer going forward. So, you know, how it's either, you know, bring in a bigger money goalie or re sign a Vander Kane or, you know, there's a lot of decisions to make. Yeah. What happens with the Vander Kane situation? I mean, he, he, he scored at a pace that would earn you know, player X, if it wasn't Evander Kane, if there weren't questions about his character or his commitment or or whether or not it would make sense for a team to commit long term, if it was just player X that was scoring at the pace he was, you'd be talking about an eight, nine, nine and a half million dollar a year type player. With Kane, there will be maybe some reservations, but at the same time, he showed he can still play the game at a high level. Um, is he going to get his eight or nine million? Is he going to get term from a team? Is it going to be Edmonton? It only it only takes one, right? And and that's the key. Vander Kane's an interesting case because you know everybody knows some of the the details in his life. This is not a guy that, uh, boy, I want to turn my you know hundred million in the bank into two hundred. Vander Kane declared bankruptcy in the yeah. last calendar year, so him coming to Edmonton was to play with ninety seven and twenty nine and rebuild his value so he could sign a $50 million deal with somebody this offseason. It, it, it's not about, uh, oh, I hope he likes Edmonton, and boy, didn't you have fun playing with Connor McDavid? I'm sure he did. Uh, but this is going to be a, a dollars. It usually is with players, but this for sure is going to be a who gives me the most dollars, what state uh, can I go to that is, is the – is the most lucrative tax wise. Yeah. Um, you know, what about could, Vancouver? And it might be a nice fit for him. He's from no. there. He played for the Giants, you don't think? It's uh that that market is um uh, it's not always a bad thing. He would he would not survive in that market. Like it would be all about everything off ice and very little about what he does on the ice. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So not friendly territory, you don't think? No, I don't think so. I mean, listen, I'm not going to criticize fans for, you know, caring about other things outside of, of, of hockey. I mean, um, I don't view sports that way. I don't view athletes as role models. I, I, if I'm building a team, give me all the bad guys if I can win games. That's my opinion. Um, the, I, a lot of people in Vancouver don't, don't share that. So someone having some legal things hanging over his head, it would, be a, it would just be a bad start for huh. the new organizational regime in Vancouver. Yeah, it'd be I, I very think. interesting to, yeah. to listen to the conversations that he's having with his agent. Who, who uh, Zach he, want, he wants every last dollar. And if I'm Edmonton, I probably do offer him, you know, $21 million over three years, but it's just not going to be enough yeah. to keep Evander Kane. Yeah, interesting stuff. You, you, Kyler Yamamoto had a bit of a coming out party. Zach Hyman was obviously Ryan huge McLeod for the was so Ryan good. Ryan yeah. McLeod, yeah. gosh, can that guy ever skate? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see sort of how this all plays out. Dylan Holloway had a chance to skate in front yeah, of a uh, hot prospect Evan for this Bouchard team. too. Yeah, so they do got guys coming up, and they you know they the 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 Oilers are the only team of this top four that are left that still have their first round pick, and they had three guys: Broberg, Holloway, uh, this kid Xavier Borgo playing in the Quebec League final right now. Three first round picks that didn't really play in this postseason. So you know, don't believe what everybody tells you. You know, the cupboards are not bare, and, and yeah. they're going to have some decisions to make on players. But there's there's more guys coming up. Yeah. 
love Evan Bouchard, love the big shot, but I, I do I do question his commitment battling for that puck. There were a couple on the wall that he gave, and I just went, oh, man. I mean, like, I, I, know, I, I got him though? on my fantasy team, friends. Yeah. Wax knows that. I want him to succeed, but I just, I, I don't know, man. I, you know what? I think, well, he's, he's very young, and he's offense first guy, and if you're Edmonton, um, I think when you make the conference final, a lot of, things get validated if you don't like what Ken Holland did to this player or this player well you're in the conference final you get sure. the last lap I think one mistake the organization did make was was bringing back Tyson Berry a year ago uh you know there is some money that could be used elsewhere Evan Bouchard can clearly run power play one and if Evan Bouchard was playing a little bit tougher minutes over the last year and a half that play against JT Comfer, he probably knows what to do yeah. a little more, right? All this stuff builds up for a long time. You've been killing it at thehedgepod.com. That's where people can subscribe to what you're doing. They can learn more about this new project, a daily sports podcast with awesome angles uh, on fantasy and betting and everything people are getting into these days. Who do you have coming up today on the show, Wax? Uh, we have, <laughs> this, you know, the Homer Simpson meme where he just disappears in the bushes. <laughs> That's kind of Oilers jersey to Blue Jays jersey. So today we have the uh, radio voice of the... Toronto Blue Jays, Ben Wagner, great story, 14 years riding the buses in the minors. And if you're a baseball broadcaster, it's a lot like the grind that players go on until you make the big leagues. And yeah. now he's the voice of the Blue Jays. So, How cool is yeah, that? Pretty exciting. Be the voice of the Blue Jays. Nice get. Again, the hedgepod.com is where you can subscribe uh, to what Wax is doing, a proud relay podcast. So we're back at it tomorrow. Before we go, I want to remind you how proud we are to partner with the team at Local Environmental. We know that there are movers and shakers, uh, community contributors that tune into this show, and that includes people that are putting festivals together, children's festivals, music festivals, community gatherings, Tis the season, these beautiful summer months ahead of us. If you're looking for fencing, portable toilets, water hauling, maybe you got to fill up a dunk tank, <laughs> look to localenvironmental.ca in Alberta and Saskatchewan. You can request a quote live on their website, localenvironmental.ca. Don't forget to send us your trash talk every Friday presented by the friends we've got. Proud to call them friends at Local Environmental. At parkpower.ca, you'll find an easy way to compare rates what you're paying right now on electricity, natural gas, and internet. Be honest. When's the last time you took a look at how competitive that landscape is? Do you know if you're getting a good deal on your power, your natural gas, your internet, or not? Are you paying too much? Want to take five minutes for yourself today at parkpower.ca and check it out. They can bundle the utilities together, which saves you even more money. And when you bring your business over there, use the promo code 2022-REALTALK. They're going to knock $70 off your first bill from parkpower.ca. Our friends at Infinity Healthcare want to remind you that they are hiring. They're always hiring because more and more families are looking to Infinity Healthcare for reliable, quality, compassionate home care. If you go to infinity-8.ca and just look under career opportunities, you'll see healthcare aid, LPNs, licensed practical nurses, the customer care navigators, and the Infinity Healthcare ambassadors. Their team works across the province to ensure that your loved one is getting an appropriate situation when it comes to home care, language barriers, cultural sensitivities, the tender care you need for somebody living with dementia, perhaps maybe it's a loved one that's just lonely. You can trust Infinity Healthcare with their care. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you they've got their special summer blizzard lineup right now for a limited time at the Dairy Queens and Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. That includes the Girl Scout Thin Mints Blizzard, the Drumstick Blizzard with Peanuts. That's my personal recommendation from last weekend. The Reese's Pieces Cookie Dough Blizzard and, of course, the Cotton Candy Blizzard, which took me by surprise the other week. I was telling you, enjoyed it a little. It, it was off the board. My wife, Carrie, said, I'm surprised you went with the Cotton Candy Blizzard. I said, well, I want to remain open-minded as the host of Real Talk. So I made that <laughs> commitment, Johnny, and tried out the Cotton Candy Blizzard. And before we go, finally, I want to remind you, our friends at Eden Landscaping, I mean, this is the time of year where they are going pedal to the metal because they've got clients, many of them return customers, I was asking Mike at Eden Landscaping, I said, you must have some people that have been with you for the 20 plus years you've been in business. He says, they've done yards, some people, three, four different houses. How cool is that as a business owner that these folks continue to trust Eden Landscaping with their biggest investment? 
as they bring outdoor spaces to life. A custom landscape builder with more than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. But think beyond simple landscapes. It's about more than fire pits and planting boxes. Eden does retaining walls. They do brand new fencing projects. A real talker just reached out for a quote the other day. They do it all. You can check out their services and get a quote today at landscapeedmonton.ca. So we've got the hedge coming up a little bit later on today, and we are back at it, putting together an edition of Real Talk for you tomorrow that will continue to hit on the top stories making news, both here at home and abroad. We're keeping an eye on what's happening with Boris Johnson, of course, over in the UK. That's a big... We've also got news developing on the federal politics front. Real Talk's here with you through it all. Our team looking at the conversations that need to happen, but you can play a role in furthering that conversation as well. We welcome your emails, your feedback on our hashtag RealTalkRJ, and of course to talk at RyanJesperson.com. Thank you for liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing what we do. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook Shivers. Account coordinator, Lawrence Derlego. Human resources, Lena Shepard. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola. Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis Settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.